Jalankayu constituency is a misnomer, really. It is not just made up of Jalankayu private estate, which is the only area in Singapore with the name Jalankayu. In fact, the constituency comprises three HDB estates, Ang Mo Kio Avenue 3 and Avenue 10, Serangoon North Avenue 3 and Avenue 4, Bangkok Crescent, Bangkok Link and Bangkok Green. And it's also made up of four private estates, one of which is Jalankayu private estate, the other three is Gerald Mugliston, Luxus Hills and Salita Aerospace Park. So Jalankayu may be known for its prata and its eateries, but what, what not all of us may know about the constituency is that this is, the, this is where you can find the last kampung on Singapore mainland. That is Kampung Lorong Bangkok. The only other kampung left in Singapore is on Pulau Ubin. Under the URA Master Plan 2014 revised, Kampung Lorong Bangkok will make way for a three-lane expressway and the construction of two schools, presumably a primary and a secondary school. With your permission, Mr. Speaker, may I display some slides and photos on the LED screens? Please do. Thank you. Okay. You can see from the URA master plan, um, Kampung Lorong Bangkok is that small little purple square that will sit, that is now sitting on what is planned to be a highway and two schools. Mr. Speaker, while I understand the need for urban redevelopment, Surely we can still find space in our urban areas to preserve part of our heritage, not simply for sentimental value, but for the purpose of heritage, historical, and environmental education. I would like to propose for the preservation of Kampung Lorong Bangkok as a conservation site or heritage education site. Under the URA master plan, the land where the Kampung is will be made into two schools, like I said earlier, presumably one primary and one secondary school and another highway. Is there really a need to displace the kampung residents, tear down the kampung in the name of urban redevelopment? Surely we can explore ways where the kampung can coexist and in fact, enhance and bring value to urban life. This is the last kampung we have left on our mainland, situated on a land of about 1.22 hectares. There are 26 families or households living in Kampung Lorong Bangkok, each paying a monthly rent of between $6 to $30 to the landlady, a 65-year-old lady named Ms. Seng Mui Hong. Some have lived here for more than 50 years and would not live elsewhere, even though their children are living in HDB estates and HDB flats and can house them comfortably in their flats. The neighbours all know one another very well, and each time I join my grassroots volunteers and residents there, the children visiting the kampung would have lots of fun chasing the kampung chickens, learning about the different fruit trees, rambutan, banana, noni, cocoa, you name it, and marvelling at the homes that look like they are frozen in time in the 1960s. Our Jalankayu grassroots have done several community projects with the kampung residents, um, one of which is the drain redevelopment project. Another one is where we gravel the main entrance to the kampung, and we put up signages for the kampung because back then in the past, the only signage you could see was one that was handwritten in paint. So this was me with uh, Miss Seng, the landlady. And you can see this is a new signage we put up, I think a few months back. And the old name of the kampung is Kampung Silak Kain, if you can see the small words there. Silak Kain in Malay means um, you fold up your sarong or your kain because in the past, the kampung always used to flood. That's why we did the drainage project, so you seal out your kain. Yeah. These are some of the houses in the kampung. Quite grand, I think this, was a, this is the biggest house in the kampung out of the 26 available. It's two-storey, all made of wood. And this is what you can see in the kampung now. Um, you can see that in the background, there are BTO flats sprouting all over. And this is another look at the kampung. So the neighbours all know one another very well. And each time I join them, they will always be talking about how they want to continue living in the kampung. And even though some of the children may not want to live there, they want to retain the kampung for as long as possible. It is quite fascinating to, the, to see this kampung, which exemplifies racial and religious harmony. The kampung is owned by a Chinese lady 
but the majority of the residents are Malay, living harmoniously with their Chinese neighbours. There is a Muslim surah or small mosque within the kampung, and there are altars that adorn the homes of the Chinese residents. Many of our Jalankayu residents have expressed their support to preserve the kampung, and one of them, a resident artist, Mr. Vincent Seat, have held nu numerous exhibitions showing his numerous paintings of the kampung. These are some of the paintings by Mr. Vincent Seat, a resident living in Bangkok, HDB estate. Okay. I am also embarking on a community documentation and preservation project with my colleagues from the Singapore Institute of Technology to compile a photo journal and oral history accounts of the residents living in a kampong in a bid to preserve the experiences and memories of our residents who have lived there for many years, from before our independence to this day. The changes they have observed and experienced over the years make for good case studies and rich learning for us. And for me, it is useful for the change management module I teach my students, which include topics on urbanization and gentrification and managing societal change. I would like to propose for the following to be considered for Kampong Lorong Bangkok. We should retain the Kampong as a conservation or heritage education site where we can educate our younger generations about how Kampong living was like and more importantly, what the Kampong spirit, spirit is about. The Kampong can be integrated within the two schools that are planned under the URA Master Plan. The Kampong and its residents should be allowed to carry on their lives, but it can play the additional role of a community living lab for our students to learn about our shared history, culture and traditions, race relations, and experience for themselves values and action, such as communal living, the spirit of neighbourliness, and community activism. In addition, our students can embark on community nature programmes to learn from and work with the residents on how they can grow plants and vegetables, or take care of animals such as chickens, cats and dogs in a more natural environment. On top of that, our kampung residents are exemplary in reusing and repurposing items in their farming and gardening methods. This is useful in helping our young ones be more environmentally friendly and increase their environmental awareness. I hope that the Ministry of Education can consider this, particularly in creating an authentic learning experience for values in action and for heritage and history education for our students. I understand that there may be concerns regarding the maintenance and upkeep of the kampong. I would like to propose that once the current generation of residents have passed on and their children are not keen to continue living there, then maybe the People's Association or the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth can consider taking ownership of this kampong. Singaporeans who are keen to experience what, is, what it is like to live in a kampong can do so here as part of a resilience or community leadership training program. So instead of having overnight camps at PA or outward bound campsites, this can be done at Kampung Lorong Bangkok in future. In addition, our own school children can have school leadership or training camps at Kampung Lorong Bangkok too for them to learn to live with basic necessities, working and living with nature, and what the kampung spirit is all about. The second part of my speech is on the strip of green land parcel parallel to Gerald Drive, next to Salita Springs Condominium, that has been planned to be converted to a three-lane highway, which is known as Bangkok Drive Extension. This is shown as a red line. Many residents living along Gerald Drive and in Salita Springs Condominium do not want this strip of land to be converted to the highway, citing a loss of natural flora and fauna. This is the actual strip of land that you can see from height where the planned expressway or highway is supposed to be. As you can see, this is really a green belt for both HDB and private estate residents living here. The strip of green is quite narrow and I can imagine that if URA were to proceed with the road construction here, the roads will come up close, very close, to the HDB blocks and the private estates. I've had several di dialogues with my Gerald McListon residents to listen to their concerns and to assure them I will work closely with LTA to ensure that only if the road is needed will it be built. The need to build this road must be contingent on the use of other surrounding roads, Bangkok Drive, Bangkok Crescent, Bangkok Ling, Bangkok Green, and Yochu Kang Road. In terms of traffic volume, that these other roads are not able to support. I have requested LTE to carry out a study of the usage of the roads mentioned above to justify the need to build the Bangkok Drive Extension Highway. However, I beseech MND to consider if we can shelve the plans to build this road, I would instead propose making the strip of land as a linear nature park, with proper footpaths to connect Fernvale, HDB Estate and Gerald McListon Estate. 
and to put in place cycling tracks while retaining the flora that are growing there naturally. I hope MND can consider this favourably. Mr Speaker, our green spaces and places of heritage are precious. Once gone, they are almost impossible to replace. We can, I suppose, create artificial green spaces or traditional setups to showcase our heritage, but they lack the character and soul of what has grown organically for many years. Once again, I iterate that I understand the need for urban development, but it is not a zero-sum game. Urban development and the preservation of green spaces and our places of heritage cannot be mutually exclusive. There are ways in which we can harmoniously integrate the two. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.